I know some of you are probably in her class or have taken her class. And if you haven't already, uh, I don't know if there's still time to sign up for Ways of Seeing, but you should definitely consider it. And uh, maybe this uh, introduction will change your mind if you haven't already signed up. So, uh, Ms. Bowler. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vitorino, for inviting me in. And uh, please only take my class if you're a good student. Otherwise, take something else. Oh, they're all good students here. <laughs> they, they, I mean, they're taking Spanish literature. Okay. Uh, yeah, then they're, they're, not, in. they're, they're in. They're not, they're not required to take this course. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> but I, I can vouch for all of them. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. And uh, I see some familiar names as they came in. Um, so I, uh, first of all, want to thank you for inviting me to come in and talk a little bit about uh, Picasso and Guernica and uh, the the whole um, concept of war in terms of the visual representation. How does the how does a painting or an, a, a mural influence our perception of war? Okay, so here we go. Um, I wanted to begin with this Picasso quote because. Uh, it really speaks to the heart of this conversation. And in a lot of ways, it speaks to the heart of ways of seeing uh, as a course. Um, so this Picasso quote, we all know that art is not truth. Art is a lie that makes us realize truth. Uh, those of you from my AP composition class know that we've talked a lot about the representation of the world around us through art, Plato uh, saying it's not true. But here is Picasso saying the opposite. Art is a lie that makes us realize the truth. And so art in the conversation we're having now is representing the truth of war. Um, so I thought of a sequence, the context of Picasso's painting mural. Uh, I wanted to put it in context of other art that covered scenes of war and then kind of pull it forward through photojournalism. And then I also want to give you the context of the painting in terms of his career. So that's my little preset. So I begin with a painting that was uh, a, a, a very famous Spanish painter, uh, Goya, uh, Francisco Goya. This painting is called The Third of May, 1808. The painting is actually done in 1814, and it shows the brutality of the French soldiers, the anonymity uh, as they hide their faces. We see uh, the victim who stands as a Christ figure in a heroic uh, stance as he faces death. Uh, you see the light on him. You see uh, the representation of civilization behind them in the landscape. And so this painting sets the stage for Picasso, uh, a war scene in uh, Spain. Um, I also want to point out this painting, uh, Mr. Vitorino probably has seen it in person, but I have not. And I didn't I have, have in, uh, in Spain. Have? Yeah. Yeah. And it's much larger than I anticipated. Uh, I have the sizes eight feet by 10 feet, which to me, I always visualized it more of a, a, a petite little thing. No, I, mm -hmm. I, I envisioned it more maybe like, I don't know, three by four or something like that, five feet. So uh, tell me a little bit about your impression when you saw it. Uh, well, you, you get the sense of um, the gratuity of the violence um, because the, you, you walk into a museum thinking that you're going to see some idealized forms of humanity and you're going to see something that's, if not whitewashed, at least it's going to be sanitized uh, to the point where uh, it represents the best of humanity. Uh, so when you're seeing something like this, uh, obviously it's before the advent of photography and you see that uh, artists at this time serve a purpose other than just uh, serving the aesthetic uh, sensibilities of people, but seeing that uh, the war has a certain memory, and that memory is being encapsulated here in uh, encapsulated here in this in this art. That yeah, exactly. And this this instead of just being a rep not just I don't want to minimize it. Instead of being a representation, a factual representation, this is a commentary, and it is intended to evoke emotion and 
outrage and if we think about it in rhetorical strategies that would be mm -hmm. so as a the pathos of the victim versus the machine of the french soldiers so we start with this this is what i i, I moved to this pathos which is very different uh, more inspirational in that regard this is a painting done in 1830 also about the French regime. Um, it's called Liberty Leading the People. Uh, it's an inspiration to rebellion in 1830. And I know many of you took AP uh, Euro. Do they even call it that? They call it something else now. But you World, get, think, yeah. yeah, AP World, something like that. So you have mm -hmm. this Delacroix painting, uh, which also shows the brutality of death uh, in the foreground, you have these, you have these, uh, I mean, this guy has, is his dead body and you have uh, this young man calling to action. You have a liberty as a symbolic figure leading the charge, uh, a symbolic representation of liberty. So you have a sense of the hero in both paintings. This, this is what's cool. This painting is eight feet by 11 feet. So it's almost the same exact size as the previous painting. I know many of you are unmoved by that fact, but it to me was very, uh, it, so I like finding those parallels across uh, different countries. I mm -hmm. like to see the, the zeitgeist manifested in, in different uh, ways, especially in the early 19th century where you didn't necessarily have the internet to Google, hey, what's going on in France? Um, just, uh, without being too technical, since these are close in chronology, are these both examples of, uh, romanticism? I guess you would say so. I never really think of, I see Goya as his own dude. Okay. I just, I, I didn't really consider him in that regard. Okay. But I don't know enough about, uh, his role in Spanish art in that time period. Mm -hmm. but I definitely, but look at the difference though in the two of them. If you roll out, whoops, don't want to go in. Um, just they they are similar in that they're covering uh, war, but you're you have such a different tone in the sense that one is inspirational and one is outrage. You know, in terms yeah. of well, arguably, right? They're on different ends of that war. Yeah, and what's it's and and they're very different. Even if you think of the the central figure here is minimized in the landscape whereas this heroic figure is is accentuated um but again you have this this theme of war okay this photograph jumps ahead uh many of you have seen it in your history books i actually i'm going to be honest i had it when it prezi zoomed in i had that was all you saw and it was so horrible mm -hmm. that elicited i thought that's not really good for kids to see but uh you're not kids you're students um this is a paint i mean a photograph of uh you know the vietnam war we have the central figure is a victim a child the rawness of her pain in the foreground we have this young man in in terror um this is war as well. And then you have the passivity of the soldiers behind them. Uh, and the, the pain is in the foreground. The pain, uh, like the previous images, is about the, the brutality of war. Um, the good news is that young woman in the center does go on to survive the napalm burns and she does she is alive today i forget where she lives but but this and, and i thought what was also interesting was this was part of the resolution of the french occupation of vietnam and so i thought oh those french uh but i thought about this idea of the legacy of that kind of imperialism playing itself out in 1970 i guess this would be i think this was 73 but um you can google that but this 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 also this image evokes so much emotion in the american public when they see it i think it was in life magazine this trauma of the child that they are 
uh, a part of. They are culpable in the perpetuation of this uh, war. So, in and so, so in some ways, if you think of who's the audience, it was the American public who had to change the tide in support of the Vietnam War. Um, so. We talked a lot about three different images that are not Picasso. Let's turn now our attention to Picasso. Um, so this is the type of art Picasso was doing in general in 1937. And uh, he did a lot of domestic scenes. He was very inventive as an artist. Uh, his, his career really takes off around 1904 where he has his blue period. He's a young man, a prodigy as an artist. Um, when he was a child, his father lent him the paints and paper and all that. And uh, Picasso was so talented as a young man that the father said, I'm done. Here's the stuff. Keep it. Uh, Picasso also was late to read. Um, so he was uh, dyslexic from what I understand. And uh, so you see how the visual world for him is so much more represent, uh, representative of his ideas because he had this uh, barrier learning to read. Um, and luckily for us, right, uh, terrific artist, really innovative. He was freed, liberated by the uh, camera in that regard. He didn't have to represent reality. He could mm -hmm. make art about uh, free expression. So in the same way you think about the shift from classical music to jazz, or you think of the shift from, uh, I don't know, to, uh, modern literature and what is it doing in terms of shaping our, our consciousness. He's got, a, he has more tools available to him. Uh, do you think, I'm sorry, do you yeah. think that's because of the advent of photography that now it sort of displaced the role of art so that art could now be free to you know, not work within the dimensions of just, you know, the human ideal. Exactly. Exactly. I, I think so. And then once 45 hits, uh, 1945, the artist is even liberated from having to do subject matter. It becomes philosophy for at least 50 years, 60 years. And so it's not necessarily about representing something accurately. Like if you think of Renaissance art, all those years, they could paint Mary and child. Mm -hmm. It just the narrative was set and they were representing nature i mean nature or the human in such a beautiful way that the craft was the the craft was the art mm -hmm. as the craft is now removed because you can you know i like i don't as a writer i don't know if i could write an iambic pentameter mm -hmm. <laughs> liberated from that so in a lot of ways the modern artist is able now to break from having to represent reality. And so you go from that Goya who uses a realistic representation to give you the pathos. Now you just have the pathos. Mm -hmm. um, and the weeping woman is such a, a, an iconic figure that it ruins the woman's life who, this, uh, who was his uh, lover at the time. So Picasso, 1904, starts his artwork. He begins to experiment. Uh, 19, uh, I would say, 07, he's starting Cubism. He saw a mask exhibition uh, in Paris in um, around that time period. A lot of artists went to that exhibition of African masks, and it really influenced their future uh, work, Cubism. So what Picasso does is he shatters the three-dimensional illusion and flattens it so that you see two sides of a portrait at the same time. So you see her both in profile. I think you can see my cursor. So you have her in profile mm -hmm. and you have her uh, three-quarter view. Hmm. Dora Moore is the woman in the painting. She was actually a successful artist and photographer in her own right. She was photographing um, for, she was a photographer for women's magazines at that time. She was uh, originally from Argentina and moved to Paris. Picasso moved to Paris. Um, so they knew each other um, well. <laughs> uh, and 
unfortunately, this painting was so, he was already very famous at this time. He was a well-known artist. So he does this series of portraits of her because their relationship was not a very uh, stable one. And he does this image of her weeping and he does a, he does a whole series of them. And so her poor, her poor career ends up in the crapper because she gets known as the weeping woman. Um, their relationship hmm. doesn't last long. And she, she ends up, she continues her art career. Um, a lot of her work just stayed in storage. She died, I think at 89 years old or something like that, uh, in the maybe 1990. Um, so, uh, I thought that was an interesting detail because this weeping woman shows up in Guernica. Um, also around that time period, uh, Picasso does a whole series of minotaurs, which is, uh, you know, half bull, half man. Uh, it's so those of us who are Torians, uh, perhaps appreciate the, the bull all the more. Uh, at that time, 1937, Picasso was using the bull symbol as uh, masculinity, power, virility. Uh, mm -hmm. I, this is the cleanest one I could show. I uh, spared you some of the other images were more about prowess. Um, well, and I so, appreciate that. <laughs> I'll, I'll say that for ways of seeing. Take my class. All right. Okay. Um, so he was using this symbol as not just Spain and bullfighting, but also his own identity as a Spaniard. He was not in terms of exiles, he had not, he left uh, Spain or yeah, Spain in uh, 1934. And I don't think, according to my research, uh, he never returned. Um, Which, so, you he, know, thinking about where Spain ends up for the next 40 years, that makes sense. Yeah. So he is in exile. Uh, he, so in 1937, it's the Paris World's Fair. And as you know, they didn't have Google and they didn't have the internet. So the world, they didn't have travel really, uh, only for really affluent people and with a lot of time on their hands. And so um, the World's Fair brought it to you, brought the world to you. So you know there's one in Queens, mm -hmm. uh, as I don't know, I'm sure your students know, but they had one in Paris, 1937. And Picasso was commissioned to create the mural Guernica yeah. um, by the Republic at least by, from our, our reading right yeah the the uh, it, but it's at the uh, Spanish Expo mm -hmm. so so what stood out when you know I didn't really think about it I didn't really articulate why this painting is an anomaly in Picasso's career um, first of all Picasso in general if you look at the entirety of his career it's really about the domestic scene uh it's really um intimate it's it's about the human um relationships either the relationship he's having with the model or the relationship the people in the painting are having um so this one stands out in its political nature uh, Dora Maar, it seems, did have an influence on his uh, involvement in terms of politics. Um, the painting, the mural, is 11 feet high, 25 feet long. Yeah, it's massive. You walk in and it basically it takes up the whole room. And it really didn't move until 1981. It was returned to Spain. Mm -hmm. until government changed. Um, yeah. It was at the Museum of Modern Art until then, uh, and it was removed under, you know, cover of darkness. It was it was not uh, publicized that it was leaving. Um, because I know someone who was interning there at, at the time, and they said, you know, every day they walked past it, and then one day it was like, wait, what? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, right, put that in your pocket. Mm -hmm. uh, at some pants. So... <laughs> Here we are looking at this painting, and I know you guys have seen some of the uh, the two videos. I watched them as well, so I won't belabor the point, but I'm just going to talk a little bit about how I would analyze the painting in terms of uh, its visual representation. So the fact that it's black and white, I think, gives a... It does a few things. It's almost 
more brutal in its extreme. Um, it reminds me of the newspaper in that regard. Uh, if you think of the photojournalism photo, that black and white. Mm -hmm. um, and also he is reading about this in the news as opposed to being on the ground in Spain. So uh, the fact that it's a newspaper um, story, but I also think that it makes it a stark contrast between good and evil, light and dark, um, that, that kind of extreme. And those of you who are in my class know that we saw that kind of motif in Macbeth as well. Um, so a lot of discussion. He didn't really go into the symbolism, but I want to talk about what I'm, what I'm feeling. So I think the bull, if you think about the virility uh, that he was using for the Minotaur and his own identity, this bull seems bewildered. It's uh, impotent, if you will, to take away the strength of the bull. And, uh, you know, he's, he's also seen both in uh, frontally and in um, profile. And he stands over, helplessly, really, stands over the, weep, the weeping woman here, the pain in this uh, figure as you see the mother holding the dead child. A lot of women in this painting. Um, we have the soldier on the ground who's di who's disembodied. It's this, you know, fractured. It's a fractured scene. The chaos of war representing the, you know, shattering the peace of that moment in the in the Basque village. Um, you have the horse in pain. Um, this figure to me really is interesting. Look at the contrast. Remember, we had the liberty leading the people. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm keeping an eye on time. How long do I have till? We have about nine minutes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have this figure with the candle in the darkness. Remember our Macbeth where uh, Lady Macbeth is holding that, that taper candle and an out, out brief candle, this idea of the light being a flickering, temporary, extinguished uh, as she looks if you compare it to the Delacroix with Liberty leading the charge, this is instead very different. I mean, there's no body. The, the, it's, it's this arm reaching out in the darkness. Um, the light bulb always is something that's interesting to me. If you think about uh, Mr. Vitorino and I did a guest, uh, another, another uh, guest lecture collab on a book called Brave New World, 1932, talking about technology. If you think about, if you visually imagine the painting without the light bulb, I almost, you know, it becomes any war. Mm -hmm. uh, the electric, people talk about it being about the machinery of war. Um, but for me, it also dates the paint, the painting as of that particular context, as opposed to being a universal discussion of war. It commemorates 1937. Um, as we move, uh, I think about this one in terms of heaven and hell. If you think of the Hieronymus Bosch paintings of Dante's Inferno, influenced pieces, you know, this idea of being hell on earth mm -hmm. uh, is how I see this uh, figure kind of, you know, boiling alive or trying to get out of, of that kind of, uh, I see, the, read these as flames um, on some level. But the jaggedness of the painting is really, let me pull out of the scene here, you know, so um, it's and a that lot came up in our film as well. This the, de the the little boy asks the the teacher, you know, what is hell, and the teacher responds that hell it, hell on earth that we make our own hell, uh, based on our actions or inactions. So yeah, that's an interesting point. Yeah, and and there are uh, there are very few references to hell in the Bible, which is also interesting. But that's that's next week's lesson. Uh, let me see. Uh, sorry, sorry. So we see then Picasso shift after this to paint, doing illustrations and paintings of doves, which are uh, a sign of uh, peace and goodwill. Uh, comes from Noah's Ark, uh, a dove 
arrives at the ark with a an olive branch so you have this idea of peace and he takes it very seriously because paloma is the name of his uh daughter and uh having to do with a dove and which is always very nice for me my maiden name being palumbo um a good tie -in. what's that it's a good tie-in yeah and I prefer I prefer to think of it as a dove rather than a pigeon. Um, my father uh, has tried to say that it means war eagle, but uh, I I know better. But which is obviously kind of funny because oh, who is this? Decline. It's, my, it's Jackson's girlfriend. Oh. Uh, the um, idea of Palumbo being more about the peaceful bird as opposed to the the eagle. Um, is that my last? No, I have to do it one more. That's it. Uh, so I've blathered long enough. Um, let me unshare and see if anyone has any questions for me or anything. Yeah, any questions for uh, Mrs. Bowler? There you are you alphabet soup here okay uh so i just want to uh wrap up by thanking mrs bowler for this uh i know this is probably quicker than she would have liked in terms of a discussion but uh i thought it was very helpful in terms of giving us context uh for the art uh, and really tying it back to what was going on in spain at the time and really looking at picasso's the trajectory of his career and looking at his predecessors as well you know, I, I, and I want to just, if I could just add one last thing, think mm -hmm. about you guys are living in a moment of history, as people have said to you, and you may roll your eyes about it. Maybe it's now suddenly said it, you know, setting in that I'm living in history. Um, some of the best ways to represent your own uh, feelings about this is to reach out to your sketchbook or to do some photography, some firsthand writing, some poetry. Um, what what authors and artists musicians offer is a way to shape the experience so that future ge generations understand the truth of that moment so don't sell yourself short you're living history and at any moment in your life you're living a moment in history so uh you have you have an opportunity now if you are feeling so moved to chronicle it so i'd like to thank mr vitorino for inviting me in and uh, thank you guys. No, thank you.